our next speaker is uh, Peter. Um, Peter is a research scientist in the Internet Technologies Research Group uh, at the HW Hamburg. Um, our original, uh, his, his original background is on electrical engineering, but when he joined the Riot team, he also experienced that networking people and embedded system programmers are also nice persons. <laughs> um, and his uh, interests lie in radio uh, technologies, radio communication. And um, yeah, uh, he, was, he also put a lot of effort in analyzing um, the performance of the Riot network stacks. It was somehow painful, but um, that significantly to improve the current uh, implementation. And today he's talking about something completely different. He's talking about uh, new cryptography fundamentals for the wire. Here we are. Just one second to render, but thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome to a new crypto fundamentals right? Yeah. Here we are. So as we just learned in the previous talk, we need some sort of usable security uh, for the IoT. And usable security also involves certain system resources. On the hardware side, the IoT brought up lots of low-cost devices, also called common of the shell controllers, COTS here, <coughs> which usually don't provide us with uh, secure hardware systems or mechanisms such as trusted platform module, little software guard extensions or untrust zone to reduce the device cost. The lack of computational power and the absence of these uh, secure hardware components requires us uh, to implement efficient software uh, to fit the device constraints. Required resources for security protocols in the IoT involve resources such as high quality random numbers, soils, cryptographic keys, and the like. And uh, this is why we are going to introduce um, crypto fundamentals to address these uh, software requirements. The key technology that, we'll, that I will focus on here are so called physical and clonable functions. Um, now, a function uh, is basically some sort of black box with an input which we prefer. Uh, challenge in the following, and an output, uh, the function maps the, the, the input to an output, which we call response in the following. In our case, the function is basically a digital fingerprint, which is based on uh, manufacturing process variations, and uh, the ex extracted response from this function identifies a device like a human fingerprint. So, a uh, kind of secret is hidden in the physical structure of a hardware device which makes it somehow hard or nearly impossible to predict it and to clone it. Um, there exists a variety of different pub technologies based on electronic circuit uh, delays or magnetism, optics or uninitialized memory pattern. And it's worth noting at this point that um, the same as with any biometric data <coughs> such as fingerprints or retina scans, pub responses are somewhat unique but also affected by noise. To summarize, a path response consists of two major <coughs> components. The one is the noise, which can be used and extracted for random number generation or seed generation to seed uh, pseudo random number generators. Uh, this parameter basically qualifies by obviously the presence of noise, or which we will call it in the following uh, intra device variations, which basically means the path response um, path responses vary each time we challenge. Um, a device with this uh, input. Um, the identifying component uh, is used for or can be used for identification and authentication systems, secret key generation or storages, or device unique application to, to device bindings such, such as in secure boot systems. Um, it qualifies by reproducibility or reliability, which somehow conflicts with the aforementioned noise component. We will deal with this later. Basically, this means um, um, that the path response should be the same each time the path is challenged. Um, the response should be device unique, um, unpredictable, and unclonable. I'm not the first one who targets this kind of field. Um, there was also some work done in research. I will just mention some of them. Uh, there was Andre Shada who focused on secure uh, applications based on SRAM puffs or different kind of puffs on embedded devices. Herberger and his group analyzed different SRAM technologies under varying environmental conditions to generate uh, free energy seeds. 
do this is um, and this group analyzed and presented different techniques to generate crypto crypto safe keys from noisy fuck responses. Christoph Bursch presented an FPGA based implementation for key generation and analyzed the performance on this FPGA. And there's also initial work uh, which proposes attacks, attacks against unconstructed keys. But so far, we could not find any sort of lightweight open source C implementation or, or lightweight operating system integration. And this is why we will implement SRAM based puff, puffs in Riot for C generation as well as key generation. And thereby, we will focus this SRAM component as this is basically. Uh, exists on any kind of platform that we have, at least on most. So, now I gave you a brief introduction into PUFFs, what PUFFs means, uh, what, what they require, how they look like. At the following of this talk, um, I will first give uh, some, show you some SRAM memory analysis of standardized devices, which we did to check the suitability for our needs. Um, afterwards, I present our approach to uh, for a generic CDR module to, to actually, actually use the generated random seeds to seed PRNGs. This is followed by a work of progress approach to generate crypto, key, uh, crypto keys from noisy bug responses. And um, yeah, then finally, I give a brief one, uh, overview over the current implementation status in Riot, followed by next steps, aka future plans. But let's start with uh, some memory analysis. To do so, we conducted a couple of experiments with different devices. Basically, um, we have uh, a developer board here, which is powered by an external power supply, and we power on and off this device periodically with an external FTDI chip or so, um, and read out the memory pattern of uninitialized uh, RAM directly after system startup. Yeah. And thereby, one has to take care of the power downtime with the device so that the RAM doesn't hold its old state. The transistor variations of these responses uh, lead to different st cell states on startup, um, which is called the response of a unique, of a, I think, pardon, which is called the response of a weak pub. And um, this weak pub response consists of the aforementioned unique pattern plus addition and noise component. Uh, it's worth noting, though, that. Um, the, the properties of this SRAM <laughs> um, depend on, uh, can depend on varying parameters such as uh, SRAM technologies, uh, sport circuits, and also environmental parameters. So if you actually want to deploy that kind of thing later on, um, you should definitely evaluate your environment and your specific device before it to be on the safe side. So first to analyze the intra-device variations, we compared 50 reads of one kilobyte memory on five different uh, SMD21 microcontrollers under ambient temperature. And to quantify the randomness, we calculated the uh, percentual minimum entropy according to the formula here, which is the default formula, um, with n uh, as memory length and p as uh, probability for startup states of the memory cell. And furthermore, we quantified the bias by the percentual Hamming weight. Um, so the basic bias basically counts the number of not even uh, not zero bits of a pattern and indicates whether uh, all cells are, or majority of cells are always pulled down to zero or up to one. And as we can see here in the figure and uh, the table, hanging rates around 50% indicate that half of uh, all cells are, are one, the other one are zero. So we can be saying they are not biased. And furthermore, there's a certain amount of entropy, around 5% here, which indicates that there is a noise component present. This is a component that we will use to generate random values or seeds. We also analyzed um, inter-device relations, where we compared aforementioned five controllers between each other. And to quantify the uniqueness, uh, we calculated the percentual fractional, fractional hamming distances, which basically um, calculates the, the, the number of not equal bits between two different bit strings. And as we can see, we have hamming distances around 50%, which indicates that the SRAM pattern between different devices do not correlate. <coughs> now let's have a look uh, how we actually implemented the module to, to seed our peer energies. Um, we implemented this in Riot directly after startup and even before the kernel initialization is done. 
in order to get fresh uh, memory pattern. Um, this pattern of uninitialized memory, or as I said before, the weak path response are hashed by a simple hash function. We use the DK hash here, and the uh, 32 bit result is stored in the pre reserved uh, memory section in the run. Just afterwards, uh, we continue with the default kernel initialization, followed by the auto init in write, which uh, also initializes the PRGs, and mm -hmm. thereby we utilize the uh, afford generated uh, seed. And that's it. We also did some analysis on this. Um, to prove decent S on length, uh, we calculated um, the min entropy for varying platforms and varying S from input length. And as you can see, for all uh, devices, um, we, uh, we, we converge to approximately 31 bit entropy at uh, one kilobyte S on length. It seems to be a good fit for us. Furthermore, we check the uh, distributions between sets, seats of one device. So, um, no, no, yeah, the hemming distances, the distribution of hemming distances between seats to see how these uh, vary among each other. And as you can see, for all the devices that I mentioned here, um, the distribution, distribution of hemming distances uh, follows a normal distribution around 50%. So, we consider them seats as independent. And just as a side note, uh, the current status in write is that we use a derivative of the CPU ID for uh, PNG seeding, which would have an entropy around uh, zero between different device pools. We implemented another nice feature, a reset detection. I think this is quite clear that right now, but I'm saying this again. The SR needs to be uninitialized in order to provide this amount of entropy. Um, so we need to come or boot the device from power down state. But this is not always the default case for developers where we just flash an application and repeatedly press the reset button to check our hardware uh, or our newly generated software. And um, so we implemented the mechanism to determine this kind of software resets. Thereby, we, we have a randomly selected but static 32 bit marker, which we write to a certain uh, address in the RAM. And during the next restart of the software, we just simply check if the marker is still there. If so, we consider this as a soft reset and don't generate a new seed from the, from the pattern. Otherwise, if it's not present anymore, we consider a, a good and fresh memory pattern and generate a new seed for the device. Fine. So where are we? Um, right now, I introduce paths. Um, I showed you initial memory analysis of common write devices. And um, I showed an approach how we generate or extract the random <coughs> of devices in order to generate seeds for our PNRGs. Now, in the following, I would like to focus on some reproducible numbers um, to reliably generate keys from a noisy puff response. So the component which was our friend in the previous section is not our friend anymore. Just as a, as a motivation, in order to at this point here, the first problem is um, that path responses are uh, affected by noise. Um, and the second problem is the path length. Um, the, the, the path length uh, is, can vary between whatever you select. We said something around one kilobyte beforehand. Um, but this is not the length of features that we focus on. Furthermore, these path responses are not uniformly distributed, so we need some mechanism um, to, to, to shrink this. So we try a um, reproducible puffs and, um, and high entropy uniformly distributed seeds. And um, to resolve these problems, um, the errors need to be removed and the response needs to be compressed. Um, there's something called fuzzy extractor, which solves the aforementioned problems and consists of two stages, a secure sketch and the randomness extractor. The secure sketch is basically a mechanism that um, reconstructs responses from noisy paths by means of error correction codes. And um, on the other hand, uh, the randomness extractor is, is the component that fits the actual secret and um, compresses its input. Um, it's very main, uh, in most cases, it consists of the one-way hash function uh, to generate high entropy outputs uh, uh, with uniform distribution. In practice, people also use hash tables here, where one of the functions is selected at random. Now, um, if we deploy such a system, 
this always consists of two phases, the enrollment and the reconstruction phase. The enrollment needs to be done once for each device um, um, before the actual device is deployed. Um, the enro uh, the uh, enrollment cares about um, the error correction encoding, uh, redundancy, adds redundancy, and generates some sort of helper data which is needed for later reconstruction. Um, this procedure doesn't need to be done on the actual device, it can be done on another machine to unload the microcontroller, but still this needs to be in a trusted environment as this incorporates the reference of measurement of the unique device. The reconstruction will be done on the device itself. Um, each time it starts up, it decodes uh, um, the noisy path measurement that we have, uh, and um, that's it. Now let's have a detailed look at this. Um, we implemented a common approach that is well known uh, somewhat uh, from literature. Let's first have a detailed look at the enrollment phase, which is um, done on a different machine or whole system and incorporates a noisy path measurement. At the input, we generate random code words, um, which will be encoded in the following to, uh, to generate a random code sequence. This is just a method which is known as code offset method. This is followed by the actual encoding stage. This is a concatenation of two different error correction coders, the Goda encoder and the simple repetition encoder, um, which add redundancy. Um, the second input to the system is the path reference measurement. Uh, here we apply the maximum likelihood encoding to reduce the error probability at the output of the decoder later. Um, and now if we, by XORing, the, the encoded random code sequence, the, the random code sequence with the maximum likelihood path, um, we basically treat the, re the reference path as if it was a, a corrupted code sequence rather than in typical encoding that you all may know where the message itself is decoded. Then the output of this XOR gate um, receive uh, some sort of helper data which needs to be stored on non volatile memory and thus ideally not reveal any information about the actual path itself. In parallel, um, the, C, the, the, the key can be derived um, by entropy accumulation through a cryptographic cache function. Here we use the SHA-1 implementation in Riot. Now for the reconstruction, um, the setup looks somewhat similar but a bit more complex. Um, again, this is, done, this is done on the device itself directly after startup. So at the input, or so-called reconciliation stage, uh, we have a reference path measurement, which is affected by noise, as well as the helper data. And if we explore both these components, um, um, we get the corrupted code sequence again, which can then be decoded and uh, corrected by the decoder stage of the repetition and the GoDa decoder. Um, here we have the random byte sequence again at the output, if needed or not. And by renewed encoding of this sequence, uh, XORed with the helper data, we receive the maximum likelihood path response again, from which we can, by applying the same uh, secrecy uh, accumulation function from the environment, derive the same key on the device during startup. And here we see one way advantage, which is that the key does not necessarily be, to, uh, be present on any memory, uh, volatile or non volatile. You can just generate it on the fly and forget it. Of course, we could store it if we want, but we don't need to. <laughs> now, there are some different parameters that are interesting to consider when one builds such a system. One is the error probability. Um, what's the probability for, uh, for a bit error between corrected paths? Um, to, to give an estimation, we first measured the bit error probability of different path responses which was around 10%. Uh, and by applying the module, uh, model of a binary symmetric channel here, which is a common approach, um, we calculated a bit out of error probability of five times to the five times 10 to the power of minus seven, which is somewhat conservative. If you look at our literature, we consider some, something around uh, 10 to the power of minus seven as conservative. One other interesting question for the actual secret generation is uh, what's the minimum path 
length, what's, how long should such, such, such a path be in order to generate a certain amount of secret and unpredictable bits. Um, here, I'd like to refer to, to, to this resource here. Um, they basically propose a module, uh, a model that um, estimates uh, the number of needed input input bits from a, from the measure, path measurement in order to generate the number of secret bits at its output. Um, the reason why these numbers are not equal is because uh, there's some sort of mutual information between different path responses, which we also see, saw in, um, in previous analysis. And, um, it's the reason why we need some additional bits in order to generate real secrecy. Yeah, by applying this model, um, we find that in order to generate 32 bits or secret bits, we need at least 42 uh, path response bits at uh, the output of the entropy accumulation. Um, if we consider the entropy encoding of the cognitive native encoder stage, um, this number raises up to 1056 bits or 132 bytes, which is not too much compared to the to the actual to, to the before men, aforementioned uh, random extractor. So conversely, if we want to generate 128 secret bits, we need uh, 495 half bytes. And for practical reasons, uh, we decided for 528 bytes here because our implementations align smooth with multiples of 132. Yeah. So we did some initial measurements uh, and deployed this mechanism on two different devices. Again, uh, the Atmos MD21 device and another one, the ST Microelectronics STM32M4. Uh, the former consists of a Codex N0 running at 48 megahertz, and uh, the latter consists of a Codex M4 uh, running at 162 megahertz. And the first thing that you can see here is that the Atmel node is around 20 times slower than the ST board, which came a bit uh, to a surprise for us. But um, the reason is that we implement this me mechanism again directly after system startup, even before any system clock initialization is done. Uh, so from this, we learn that, um, that the performance, the runtime performance of such, such a system, does not necessarily correlate with the intended CPU speeds. Another interesting thing uh, here is that uh, SHA-1 as well as the repetition code are the most expensive uh, functions. Um, the SHA-1 comes to a certain complexity, so on these really constrained devices uh, comes to a certain cost, but not too surprising. The repetition decoder uh, should be analyzed in more detail um, at this point because it's basically decoding a repeated sequence of, of equal, hopefully equal bits. But however, in the end, um, we see uh, absolute numbers between a couple of up to 200 milliseconds um, for the whole procedure, which is done, just done once directly after startup. So we consider this as tolerable. OK, so far so good. I guess this was a lot of detail. Now let's have a look what uh, the actual um, status uh, of our efforts is. I propose the uh, peer energy studio module, the first section of the talk, and the fuzzy extractor, uh, fuzzy extractor uh, in the second uh, part of the talk. Now, for the CEDA, um, we implemented and already merged it for Cortex M based platforms, and uh, this PA, PR came with an evaluation tool to actually evaluate uh, the entropy of generated seeds. I also presented, if you figure it or not, an uh, AVR 8 bit. Um, platform measurements, so the implementation is there, but not yet PR. <coughs> now, for the fuzzy extractor, um, I presented measurements for Cortex-M devices, and of course, we have some sort of uh, helper data generation tool, otherwise we couldn't present these measurements. Um, so the code for everything is there, it runs, it works, but it needs further cleanup in order to be PR, which will be done in the following couple of days. Um, yeah, so far we didn't manage to implement this method for AVR platforms. So what's on our agenda? What's next? What are our future plans? Um, for the general part, of course, implement the missing components. One other interesting thing uh, that we want to consider is the evaluation of S1 pattern when the device comes from deep sleep mode where parts of the S1 memory are powered off, but not the whole microcontroller. Um, now, uh, we want to extend our random suite in various, various terms. First, we would like to add a second and secure seed, 
for uh, cryptographic risk for clean energies. Um, to do so, we might need to change our random API slightly uh, in order to enable parallel seeds for one, one for uh, the aforementioned cryptographically secure pure energy and uh, another easy and fast seed which you can use for random delays and the like. Um, furthermore, we need to correct the seed handling in right. Um, which is currently just consists of a global seed which can be overwritten. We want to implement application based seed provisioning. And furthermore, when we touch the API, we will also consider adding an interface in order to generate um, or report back events such as research, uh, reset detection or soft reset detection. Uh, and finally, we plan to apply the NIST statistical test suite uh, in order to, to, to quantify the randomness of our approach. Now for the fuzzy extractor, there's uh, also uh, still a lot of work to do. One really important thing is the proper evaluation of the actual privacy of the public helper data piece, which needs to be stored in non-volatile memory. Um, another interesting thing, which goes more on the direction of me measurement, is the is a measurement of uh, the bit error probability on the embedded devices itself themselves. And if you remember, uh, we mentioned something what around the bit of error probability of 10 to the power of minus 7. So this might take some time in some device restarts in order to actually find a bit error. So I hope the device will, will, will figure this out of this. Yeah, and the um, uh, last point here is uh, we plan to implement a, a build target in life in order to easily generate this kind of helper data and um, store it in, on the available non-volatile memory of the device. Yeah, and with that, uh, I'm done. And over to questions. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So, questions. So, uh, given that you uh, still have to store the helper data in the in somewhere inside the microcontroller. What's the advantage of going through all that scheme instead of uh, generating a random key from the using the first method and storing that key directly? Uh, yeah, I mean, in that case, you could read out the key. If you have access to the to the device, you could read out the key. But you could also read like the random memory and follow your procedure. Yeah, well, I'm, okay, I, I just mentioned the big path, and of course, if you know, I mean, first you need to know the start address, of course, you just need to shift like one byte or one bit, and then the scheme doesn't match again. Uh, but furthermore, um, when people investigate on path technologies, this is like, it's called the weak path because we simply read out the path as an array. Um, if you remember the one of my first slides when I introduced paths, there's a challenge on input, and uh, if you investigate there, uh, you, you apply different schemes and patterns, which are maybe not known. So you cannot simply just read out the run and do the procedure again. Um, one thing that, that I wonder is, um, what happens if, you, if the device that I deployed uh, receives a reset condition, for example, because of a watchdog? Um, can that device, without additional hardware that allows it to stay powered down for some time at all, become operational again? Without um, further interaction, like a user turning it off deliberately and then on again? I don't, I'm not quite sure if I understand the question correctly. I guess this refers to the reset, detect, to the reset detection. Um, when, we, when the device restarts its software, um, we do do this sort of uh, soft reset detection, and if like this marker is still there, we detect an actual reset, uh, a soft reset. We just use the previously generated seed again. Okay, so, that, so that that stays in memory. Generated. That stays in memory and is accessed because the memory does not is not does not get reset. So far, yes. Okay, thank but you. But I think for, I mean, how uh, for for this like soft reset mechanism and. Still a bit open how how we would do this in future and how you will use this um, even with the proposed application based seed provisioning. Okay, so uh, since there are quite a few attacks against the S Ram path have been proposed in the cryptography literature, do you think it's still secure to use it in practice? I'm not at that point right now. 
to get this number. I mean, this is like the to do for the fuzzy extractor. Good. Any other questions or comments? Then, thanks again, Peter. Oh, there's a response. I have two questions. Two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you One for comparing personal. between different devices at some point, yeah. and were the device from the same production batch, maybe or not? And also, what you were saying, the driver can depend on environment, and what will you mean by environment? Um, so, as for the first question, um, I don't know, um, but uh, um, we, we checked like different memory sections, and of course we checked, have had more analysts than 50, 50 reads of 1K, um, so far they all had the same results. Um, I would guess they are not from the same batch. Uh, maybe the Atmel boards could be, but we also did this analysis on STM32 or 4 boards and between different ones. And they were definitely not from the same batch. Now for the second question, um, environment conditions. Uh, well, what people mostly say is uh, temperature, of course, um, humidity, and stuff like that. Yeah, if you're interested in this, I I, um, I reference this work from Herwiger and also I think Schaller. Um, they analyzed this in a bit more detail. When we start into let's say. We need to have multiple tables or multiple uh, helper functions depending on the temperature or stuff like this. Or... Um, no, not that, okay. but it could be that you don't have that amount of entropy uh, under varying conditions. Okay. So it makes secrets even more predictable or random numbers even less random. Depends. Okay. okay. Oh. Uh, if I understand correctly, you did all the uh, statistic analysis based on the assumption that your S run is not under attack, right? Or um, without any. So far, no attacks have been analyzed by us. So, yeah, uh, what if it's uh, under some attack, like kinds of uh, perturbation attack or some other attack, which will make the numbers to generate uh, exist in the S RAM turns out to be a fixed pattern, like all there also some uh, projectile numbers. Yes, of course. Then this approach won't work again. Okay. I mean, but I, I, if I if I you know hammer on the device, then a, it that, doesn't work. I, I don't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> so, so I mean, you still keep the functionality uh, of the board, but you still you use some other attack techniques and. Uh, on purpose to turn off all the transistors on the SRAM, for example, then the the, 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 the data you output from SRAM gonna be predictable, right? Yes, of course, if you just run once, if you are able to, then you need to physically access, of course, and you need to attach hardware devices, if I understand you correctly. You want to pull all the transistors to one, for example, but then you would need, to, of course, I mean, but from my perspective, this is the same as hammering on the device or, you know, like real physical interaction and that sort of uh, attack we did not consider yet. I mean, the, the implementation is barely there. Or maybe finally the output of the SRAM data for your for your uh, random numbers, changes, uh, numbers. You, you don't have to like turn on it, but you, know, you just uh, miss the output point and then you can see uh, achieve this purpose. So you don't have to, to, to you, mean, you, you mean just uh, like a hammer, use a hammer and uh, break this, right? Okay. I think I didn't get the question. Maybe we can, we can yeah, discuss yeah. this on the break. Okay, then thanks again, Peter. Thanks.